in many ways though the Tokugawa were not satisfied uh, they had uh, they'd expected to win uh, much more completely and uh, two years later uh, they found some uh, some problems with the way things were being run in Choshu um, claimed that the Choshu uh, leadership was basically uh, reneging on the terms of the deal that they'd made with the Tokugawa uh, and the Tokugawa put together uh, once again a huge army and invaded and uh, were fought to a complete standstill and humiliated. Um, the uh, Choshu government was now uh, firmly opposed to the Tokugawa. They believed that they could not, uh, that they could not trust the Tokugawa um, no matter, uh, even if they came to an understanding with them, they thought that the Tokugawa would go back on their word. Uh, and they were basically uh, in the position of, well, we have no choice but to resist. So they did, and they resisted very well. These mixed units of commoners and samurai, the Kiheitai, uh, performed very well. And there was one other very important difference between the first and second expedition. And that was the role of Satsuma. During the first expedition, uh, Satsuma had been on the side of the Tokugawa, um, putting the heel to their traditional enemy, Choshu. But between the first and second Choshu expeditions, people like uh, Sakamoto Ryoma and Iwakura Tomomi had uh, put the leaders of these domains in touch with each other, um, and these people agreed that it was not in the interest of Satsuma to keep uh, putting pressure on Choshu because that would only strengthen the Tokugawa. So during the second expedition, Satsuma actually stayed out of the fighting and unofficially it even sold uh, and funneled uh, basically uh, volunteers, uh, but also, especially importantly, uh, weapons and munitions to Choshu. So Choshu was in fact not alone anymore. Uh, they had the backing of Satsuma. And this was a very, um, uh, very important uh, reason uh, for uh, the victory in the, uh, in the second Choshu expedition. Also, it became clear that the Tokugawa were uh, going to destroy the Mori clan. They were going to destroy Choshu as an independent province. Uh, and the leaders of Choshu uh, saw this, they really didn't like that, so they had no choice but to fight or die. Uh, and the leaders of Satsuma also thought, well, this is what's waiting for all of us if we don't stand up to the Bakfu. So it's time to do that. And um, initially, the, uh, the Choshu expedition um, wasn't necessarily... Uh, the same as uh, a civil war, uh, the proponent, uh, the, the uh, where the opponents of the Tokugawa would throw to, uh, would try to overthrow the Tokugawa. Uh, but it did end up giving birth to that kind of development. Um, as we've already seen, the Tokugawa now wish to destroy their enemies, destroy these domains. Uh, that really galvanized them into resistance. Um, and also, people like Ryoma and Iwakura were forming uh, coalitions against the Tokugawa. And one other very important thing that happened was that um, these radicals who had been operating under the slogan of Sono Joy and would consider to, uh, would continue to operate under that slogan, um, learned that it was more in the ben or concluded that it was more in the benefit of Japan, uh, certainly more in the benefit of these radicals themselves and of the imperial family. Uh, it was in their benefit to learn from the West, to strengthen Japan, and then to uh, possibly challenge the Westerners later with their own military technology and economic technology, etc., etc. So these rebels against the Tokugawa, now uh, not only did they have the support of their domains, uh, not only did they have the support of uh, important uh, allied domains, 
Uh, they also had the support of the imperial family, and they were now not uh, quite so alien and threatening to the Europeans either. Many of these Europeans, uh, starting with the British and uh, then other people followed suit, uh, believed that they could work with these rebels. Uh, believed that because these rebels had now assured them that they're not going to literally expel the barbarians and kill them uh, if they should take power, that maybe the overthrow of the Tokugawa wasn't such a bad thing. Uh, some powers actively supported uh, some of these rebels. Uh, the British did. Uh, many British individuals certainly did. Some powers remained neutral. Uh, Russia was one of these. Uh, and of the major European powers, only France really uh, supported the Tokugawa in any meaningful way. Um, and that wasn't really for any kind of ideological concern. It was a, it was a, uh, a gamble that the French made um, where they, uh, they were kind of trying to supplant British influence in Japan. Uh, they thought, well, we're just going to support the Tokugawa. If the Tokugawa win, then we're, we'll be in a really strong position against the British. Um, and, you know, by the 1860s, these two countries were allies, but they were still uh, colonial competitors in some ways. Um, but uh, the, uh, the events were clearly set uh, to take their own course. Uh, after the second Choshu expedition, it was pretty clear that the ultimate solution uh, to the instability in Japan uh, would come on the battlefield. And on January 3rd, 1868, the young Emperor Meiji proclaims the restoration of imperial power. So if we're looking for an official date of the Meiji Restoration, maybe January 3rd, 1868 is a, is a good one to point to, with the understanding that events were certainly uh, headed in that direction before. Um, and uh, it would also take a short civil war uh, to really complete this restoration. And on April 7th of that same year, the imperial government issued what is known as the Charter Oath. What do they want? Why are they fighting? Well, this is an explanation. Uh, what do they want when all matters are settled? Uh, what do they want to see in Japan? Uh, an assembly widely convoked shall be established, and all matters of state shall be decided by public discussion. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, all classes, high and low, shall unite in vigorously promoting the economy and welfare of the nation. Okay, unification, uh, economic growth, got it. Three, all civil and military officials, and the common people as well, shall be allowed to fulfill their aspirations so that there may be no discontent among them. Okay. Four, base customs of former times shall be abandoned, and all actions shall conform to the principles of international justice. Uh, basically, we are going to modernize. This was kind of a dig at um, uh, what was seen as uh, the uh, stodginess of uh, samurai like the Tokugawa, who were no longer capable of quite being with the times. Five, knowledge shall be sought throughout the world, and thus shall be strengthened the foundation of the imperial polity. Kind of learn from the West. But when we look at what specifically is being outlined here, it's really vague. It's hard to tell what exactly the restoration is about at this stage. You know, what does it mean an assembly widely convoked shall be established and all matters of state shall be dis decided by public discussion? Uh, I mean, on the one hand, that kind of seems like they could be talking about something like parliament, but not necessarily, because really, who are the public uh, and who is going to be in this assembly? I mean, none of this is very clear. In part, this is on purpose, because uh, the vaguer, uh, if that's a word, the more vague uh, but generally acceptable sounding the mission statement of this enterprise is, uh, the more uh, widely they'll be able to cast their net and attract uh, the greatest number of people without uh, turning any of them off. So 
there was really a lot of work left to be done to really put a point on exactly what these domains uh, and these radical samurai and some of these commoners were fighting for. The Meiji Restoration was in many ways a haphazard affair where its leaders tried a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, saw what worked to them, saw what didn't work to them. Uh, they were not so much driven by principles as they were by expediency. And in many ways, uh, that uh, kind of approach um, was reflected in the shape of modern Japan in general. Uh, and if you're interested in modern Japan and in the influence of the Edo period on modern Japan, uh, I highly urge you to take some other classes at Fort Lewis College. Uh, I teach a Japanese history course where we spent a lot of time covering the modern period. Um, and I'd really uh, like to see you there. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, deep topic, which, which keeps being interesting the deeper you get into it. But at its outset, what is this Japan going to be? It's not exactly clear. Okay, join us next time for our last lecture.